But now to our first panel tonight, and over here on the Yes couch is Sir John Key, who needs no introduction. Catherine Marks, who worked with Lucretia Seals on that landmark case and is a friend of Lucretia Seals, and also Jessica Young, uh, who heads the Yes campaign. Now over here we have Missy Vining, whose husband Blair died a year ago this week. We have Richard McLeod, who is a lawyer uh, for vulnerable people. And we have Peter Thurkle, who heads up one of the No campaigns. Sir so John, let me start with you first. I mean, many New Zealanders won't know that you're voting yes. Could you, yep. could you tell us why? Yeah, really in simple terms, I think it's A, a little bit about choice. You know, you should be able to have that choice yourself. Secondly, it's about peace of mind. Probably most importantly, that, that option is there. And for some New Zealanders, it's about dignity in their final hours. And I think a huge number of New Zealanders you know, must feel a bit apprehensive about dying. I know that I do. And so I don't know that I would necessarily use assisted dying, but I just want to know in my heart of hearts that if I was faced with the sort of conditions that would qualify for the law, I've got the chance to do that. Now, like I say, in all probably, probably wouldn't use it. But I like the fact that the capacity for New Zealanders who want to use it, it would be there on the statute books. Sure. Missy Vining, you know, you've been through hell and back in the last year with, uh, with Blair's death from bowel cancer. You are sort of undecided on this at the moment. What, what, what's, your, what's your view? Yeah, so in principle, I'm, I'm definitely yes for having the choice. Um, but I've got concerns around um, some aspects of the bill. Yeah, I mean, what, what does concern you? <laughs> Um, the fact that when Blair was diagnosed, obviously he was given six to eight weeks to live and we had many, many great memories um, created where he lived longer. Um, he was a stoic, typical Kiwi and you know, he said to me right from the start, like, I'm going to go out on my own terms. He wanted that dignity and he also was really concerned as we went through the process of treatment, the cost of those treatments and the financial burden okay. that it could leave, leave for us girls. And that's what I speak to about many terminal patients worrying about um, the cost of the treatments and the burden on their family of care. So that's, that's why I feel that I would most likely say yes, but my concerns are around the aspect that Blair could have gone in um, signed up for end of life without speaking to me at all about that, yeah. OK, well, we'll come to all that tonight. And throughout the programme, we will also hear from Kiwis with real-life stories. This is Bobby's story. I was diagnosed with multiple myeloma in September of 16. I just found out that I've definitely relapsed. This time it's come back with a vengeance on my bones, eat them up, break them down. I don't want to die in agony. This is my oldest grandchild, Brittany, and Brittany's the one I took to Argentina. I didn't want them to forget that incredible relationship we, we had. Julia and I have been together for 33 years. That's the thing is I don't want to leave her. <laughs> this is my death, my choice. I would like to die in Julia's arms and for it to be a really neat smile and goodbye. Bobby has true passion, obviously, about this cause, and although she is very sick, she is campaigning hard right now. Now, Catherine, you were part of that legal case that put euthanasia back on the agenda. Is this what you and your friend Lucretia Seals were fighting for to give Bobby that right? Absolutely, and this is a journey, Lucretia, has taken me on and I've ended up learning more about it than I ever thought I would. What Lucretia believed in though was evidence-based law reform. And so I've continued to be involved in looking at what's happening around the world. But we have to remember that at the moment, some people at the very end of their life are suffering profoundly. Uh, where palliative care, even the best, can't relieve that. And also there's significant evidence of people taking their lives earlier than they would anyway. And it's for that reason in Canada that they found 
that not having assisted dying was a breach of the right to life, and it was that case that really inspired Lucretia to go forward. Sure. Richard, you're a lawyer as well, but you've got con concerns about this. What what are they? Yeah, look, I'm a, I'm a human rights lawyer. I come at this from a human rights perspective. I, I act for people who are vulnerable, who are being pressured and bullied by the state. That's my work. Um, I'm also the spokesperson for 200 QCs, legal academics. We've come together. We have one message for New Zealand. Don't vote for this law. It is dangerous. It is full of holes. We've found 35 holes in it. It is going to expose weak and vulnerable, terminally and ill New Zealanders to pressure or abuse. It doesn't protect them from the abuse. It um, criminally immunises their abusers. It covers the whole process up in secret. There's no proper transparency or oversight of the process as it unfolds. I mean, there are just so many problems with this. This is a recipe for abuse and a recipe for wrongful well, death. Well, well, well I'll, bring in, I'll bring in Jessica, actually. Uh, you know, do you, feel, do you feel that there's enough safeguards? Because, you know, it sounded like there's a few holes there. Absolutely. This is a safe law. It's been debated in Parliament for four years, rigorously debated, hundreds of supplementary order papers, and we've resulted with a very tight law that has 45 safeguards. It was really only narrowed down to people who are at the end of life and suffering unbearably. There are a number of safeguards that will protect people who don't want to make this choice while providing access to people who need this choice. Peter Thurkel, you're looking concerned there. Yeah, I am. I mean, we have to remember that this is an act that applies to everybody in New Zealand. Organisations like the New Zealand Medical Association are saying, look, doctors just will not be able to determine coercion. That, they represent 5,000 doctors. I think we need to listen to them. And the Royal College of GPs basically says the same thing. So why are we putting this load? And it's a very weak test. Basically, one doctor has to do his or her best to determine coercion. Now, to be honest, that's laughable. You know, you might say to a child, that's do your best, but when you're talking about life sorry. and death decisions, <laughs> to say, do your best, is completely inadequate. Is. Courts no, overseas have shown that coercion, even in a court setting around property matters, is difficult yeah. under contract okay. law. Okay. And yet with this one, all we yeah. are saying sorry. is one I doctor just, has to make yeah. the decision. Yes. Sorry, no, I'm just sorry, that is just not true. There are so many safeguards, you don't just look at one. But There's it is multiple. only one doctor making the decision, If I can just finish, it? You, uh, doctors make these decisions and life and death decisions anyway, but they're not allowed to raise it. They have to have multiple conversations over a period of time. They have to do their best efforts to make sure they're not, please let me finish, um, under pressure. If they suspect it, they have to stop. Okay. And they give guidelines around, is it enduring? Is it uh, consistent sure. I'm just, with... I'm just going to Missy, just coming back to you, you know, with that family issue there, I mean, is that something that would worry you that, you know, rather than face the health system, someone, you know, that you love might go off and do this to remove being a burden? Um, I, I spent 11 and a half months, you know, um, begging Blair not to die. Mm. Um, he fought bigger than I have ever seen anyone him want to die. But he yeah. wouldn't have gone and done it behind my back because no. he didn't love me or have a dysfunctional relationship, he would have been trying to save me. Mm. Mm. Isn't that the basic you, argument you though, that, that, that everything, we're, everything that's inside us is to stay alive. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's why if we're in the mountains or wherever it might be and, and, and we're vulnerable, we do everything we can to stay alive. And certainly, you know, you're going to do everything you can to stay alive for your family. Mm -hmm. The reality is if you look at the legislation overseas and the way it's worked, people generally have applied um, assisted dying about 10 days earlier than they otherwise would have probably naturally died. So it's very much at the end of what they're doing. And so in many respects, that's just about the dignity and maybe the pain of the palliative care isn't really working. So, yeah, I mean, the, in any law you pass, you, can't, you, you can never cover every situation. There could be someone that's coerced, there could be someone that makes the wrong call. But I'd say if you looked across the wide population, the massively overwhelming majority will get it right, actually. And, and if they choose it, it'll be a very small group and it'll be very near the end. Here's and another issue. There's 4,500 people begging for their lives right now because there is not money to treat them. Yeah. Yeah. Those people, that's, an, that's not a small number, that's just for cancer. That's right. yeah. you know. I mean, so, so John, you talk about people having you know, my life, my choice. I'm concerned about the people for whom this is going to become my life, no other choice. We're talking about people in the country who can't access palliative care because of their postcode. People who can't get pharmac funded treatment to keep them alive for years. People who are victims of elder abuse. People who are Māori. Now, what are we saying to those people with this law? We are saying to them, look, we, we can't care for you. 
or we won't care for you, but we will help you to end your lives. Now, that's not compassion or choice, that's cruelty. But the law is pretty clear. I mean, it has an enormous number of safeguards. It's actually much tighter than the legislation around the world. And the person that's to the actually be yeah. able to apply the law has to be dying. This isn't about someone who says, I want to opt out of life or I don't want to let it run its natural course. This is about someone that is dying mm -hmm. and at the very last piece of that, they are choosing the time of their death. Mm. It's quite different, I think. Well, okay, I just want to bring up something now, which is the dead and days argument. So if mm. someone does make this choice, yeah. mm. uh, people on the no side have told me that actually you could get it all done within four days between okay. getting a terminal diagnosis and actually I've heard um, this the and I've seen it. Can yes. you, can you know, you, can lethal you, dose in four days, that's a complete misrepresentation of a Ministry of Health report on the bill. What that bill said was at the minimum, it would be 15 working days and that's three weeks and it would take, and I'm quoting really from the bill, likely weeks or months. Well, respect, if you were already no, in hospital, if, if you were in hospital, hospital already days. really that's ill and dying, yeah, the minimum right. it could be yeah, with four and, working days. And the sorry if I can that finish. Said, well, no, I'm um, sorry, that's not correct, 15 yeah, days. Yeah. That's a separate clause. In hospital setting, the ministry accepts that it could happen as quickly as four days. That assumes Isn't that no doctor conscientiously objects. There's no questions about the person's competence to make this yeah, decision. And that, and that this person would is people, already Jessica, at the end of one. life, that this person that needs some to have those safeguards overridden because they are dying days. so we soon have to that, that we a... need to help them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, actually, we'll just uh, yeah, leave yeah. that conversation there. Yeah, There's yeah. a lot more to come. No, and no. Now, we will ask some doctors in just a moment about how accurately they can predict the time frames around someone's death and mm. also coming right up. And he said to me, John, I can't go on any longer. The tough choices that doctors are having to make every day.
Welcome back. This is the Euthanasia Question, a News Hub special. Some new faces on the panel now. Palliative care, Dr Libby Smales joins John Key on the yes couch. And over here on the no couch is Rod McLeod and my good friend from the project, Kanoa Lloyd. Now, Kanoa, I'll start with you. Many Kiwis won't know that you're voting no. Tell us why. Yeah, well, basically because I did what I always do when I'm wrestling with something very confusing and emotional and difficult, and I asked my mum what to do. Um, my mum has worked as a palliative care nurse for a long time now, and I thought um, initially starting to talk to her about that, that she would be like, yes, absolutely. But the more we talked and the more she shared with me um, uh, her experiences with people coming to the end of their lives, the more I started to understand how much healing there is um, at the end of life, how many relationships can be repaired and, and bridges can be built. And I came to see that as a really precious thing that I would be worried would be taken away if we didn't still have it. Yeah, so you're going to vote now? Yeah, yeah. And I'll bring the two doctors in now because one thing that I do want to discuss is the six-month diagnosis of terminal illness. I mean, mm. how easy is it to get that right or, or, or get that wrong? And starting with you, Rod, can you get it wrong? Oh, four out of five times you'll get it wrong. If you look at the international research that's been done, a guy called Nick Christakis did a huge study in the States. He found that doctors were right about 20% of the time. The rest of the time, it's made up of doctors overestimating and underestimating. So I think, you know, guessing six months is a real challenge. Yeah, Libby, you know, what do you think of that? Actually, I, I agree with Rod, which is really difficult to say on the program. <laughs> people, um, people are allowed to agree, yeah. <laughs> However, I think context is incredibly important here because at the beginning of this journey towards dying, um, things are much more uncertain. And as you get closer and closer to the moment when you die, things become much clearer. And we're talking about a group of people who are right at the end of that journey. And if we look at the international data, they probably shorten their lives by 10 to 14 days. It's a very little time in the context of a life. And the reason that they're doing that is because their life doesn't feel like a life anymore. Okay. Now, what is clear, though, is that our doctors are really divided on euthanasia. Now, a recent survey found 52% of our GPs opposed assisted dying. Dr Dave Mackay is one of them. Here is Dave's story. I have been asked to help end someone's life artificially in the past. I couldn't cross that line. People really just want to be assured they're not going to be suffering, and generally, if that can be done, then their quest for an early death is less likely to be so. The requirement of a person to take another person's life is the concern that I have. I wouldn't continue working in an organisation that required that I would take another person's life. If there was a greater number of palliative care practitioners, physicians, nurses, that there would be less suffering, less uncertainty around suffering and people wouldn't need to ask for euthanasia. Ending a life prematurely is not something that we consider a medical treatment. So Dr Dave Mackay is a strong no there and he raises some interesting points about the Hippocratic mm. Oath that doctors swear to do no harm, but that's not the view of all medical practitioners, is it Libby? No, it's interesting. Um, a, a recent poll has shown that over a third of all doctors are very pro-law change and 24% of doctors are more than willing to be part of that process. So I think it's very important to understand that there's a range of feelings and they depend on your belief system yeah. and the level of education and also your experience. Rod, you know, it'll put some doctors in a really difficult position, though, won't it, if they, well, it, if they do it, have yeah, it will, but doctors are allowed to be conscientious objectors. Mm. One of the important things to recognise is that the doctors in New Zealand who have the most experience of looking after people near the end of life are almost universal in their opposition to this law change. Way over 90% of the palliative care specialists say they don't want to have anything to do with it. So I think that's very telling because they're the ones that do this, like Dave, 
day in, day out. I, I looked after people for 30 years, roughly about 15,000 people I, and their families, I reckon. And if I was to be put in a position to enable somebody to take their own life, I, I would find that astonishingly difficult. Yeah, Sir John, I want to bring you in here because we're talking about palliative care and you've been in the top job. You know, if we improve palliative care, we might not need this, is the argument put forward by some people. But could we actually do that? Could we get palliative care to, to, to such a level that we wouldn't need, wouldn't need euthanasia? This isn't a bill about people that are living. This is a bill that applies to people who we know uh, with absolute confidence are dying. And as Libby said, there are people that will use it, at, you know, in all probability, at the very near the end of their life. And Kanawha makes a right point about reconciliation and, and all those fantastic things that happen. And I've seen that sort of situation. I've seen a situation where you desperately want to stay alive to, to just say goodbye to your family and friends. But there's also a situation where you get near the very, very end where you can be left with the lasting memories of your most loved parent is actually one of them in a terrible state. And I'm, I'm not sure you know, that's the memory I want to leave my kids. I think what everybody here, from what I can tell, agrees on is that um, we want people to be able to die with dignity. But I don't believe that this law change actually affords that to everybody. There's still unconscious bias in the healthcare system. There's still lack of resources. And my concern is that it would actually contribute to this enormous chasm that none of us know, including one of the smartest brains in the country, nobody knows how we're going to close that. So why would we vote for something that could actually ah. make it work? I'll just jump in here because <laughs> we'll just move on. As the reality out there, which we'll talk about now, is that patients are asking doctors for help to end their suffering every day. Now, John Harmon is a surgeon, and this is John's story. I was his doctor, his friend. John was my mentor and my teacher. When he was diagnosed with cancer, he fought quite a, a large and strong battle for several years. But the cancer recurred. In his last few months, I attended him regularly at home. He was suffering an incredible pain and he turned to me one day and he said to me, John, I can't go on any longer. So I told his family to light the fire in his room and to sit with him in his bedroom this winter evening because John was probably going to go to sleep and not be there in the morning. And then I put him to bed and gave him his final dose of medication. There was a stillness in the air as this really great man had left us. I did the very best I could do for my friend. He died with dignity and he died without pain. John's is a story of friendship and mateship and I know he considered it a real honour to care for his best mate in his final days. Now, it may not be well publicised but there is already a form of euthanasia that happens here in New Zealand. We've all heard the anecdotes of the extra pump of morphine to let someone slip away. It's been going on for years. In fact, way back in 2003, an anonymous survey of New Zealand GPs found 693 of them had hastened the death of a patient. Dr Libby Smales, how, how common is this? I have no idea. Um, we know anecdotally that's happened, but morphine isn't a good dr uh, drug f for doing that. However, the the issue is important, and I was talking to a GP um, just in the last couple of days, and she said, look, I'm voting yes for this act because 
in the past, I feel I've failed my patients. They've asked me for help, and I was not legally allowed to do that. So my yes vote, hopefully, is the gift of a good death for someone I'm never going to meet. Rod McLeod, you don't believe this happens? No. Well, using morphine to end somebody's life, if they're already taking morphine, is astonishingly difficult. Hmm. There was a case study 25, 30 years ago which a very brave doctor owned up to and published in the British Medical Journal said that their team had given somebody 24 times the amount of morphine that they should have had in, in one hour. Now, giving the extra pump on the morphine syringe driver doesn't ca kill somebody. I think what it demonstrates, and that survey that you mentioned demonstrates, is that doctors actually don't have enough education about what palliative care is. Our medical students come out after six years in medical school having had maybe three or four days of teaching about the end-of-life care. If they're lucky, they'll have had a day at a hospice. Now, in their first year, they're going to have to look after, on average, 40 people who are dying. Would you like somebody to look after you who'd had three or four days of training in your last weeks or months? Sir John, I'll bring you in here because, you know, is this something you've heard of, of, of people being helped to the end by, by their doctor, <coughs> people you know? Is this something you, you, you've heard of? Yeah, I think I once famously made some sort of comments like that and, yeah. and the uh, doctors came and saw me uh, on mass in my office to correct me. Yeah. Um, um, and they're, they're right in that what does happen today is that, you know, you hear, hear stories of, you know, the switch will get flicked off and, and all those things. And that is, there is a difference between what we're talking about in this bill, which is actually assisting someone to die versus unfortunately we run out of options to keep them alive. So I accept, I accept that point. And I think what doctors do today is the latter. Um, they don't assist someone to die. There's a lot to, to talk about still. So a little later, the controversial question. Would a yes vote put us on a slippery slope to more liberal laws on assisted dying? But coming up next. Well, I'm extremely grateful that it wasn't an option. I would have taken it and I'd be dead. Could there be unintended consequences for our most vulnerable?
Welcome back. Now, this is the Euthanasia Question a News Hub special. And on the yes side now, we have disability advocate Philip Patston, Dr Libby Smales, and of course Jessica Young from the Yes campaign. And joining me over on the no side is Matthew Tukaki from the Māori Council, Rob McLeod from Hospice New Zealand, and Peter Thurkel is back again. So, one of the major arguments against legalising euthanasia is the unintended effect that it may have on our most vulnerable disabled Kiwis and the elderly. This is clear story. There is this underlying assumption that our lives aren't of value. I became a tetraplegic uh, at the age of 17. I was involved in a car crash where my mum, she fell asleep at the wheel. I was extremely suicidal. The resounding feeling that I got, it was just always, oh, well, you've got a broken neck. Um, totally understand why you'd want to kill yourself. I was actually okay for a number of years. There were a whole list of issues that were compounded to create the perfect storm, and it started me on a chain event where I was attempting suicide again. I went to the suicide outreach clinic, and then we discussed uh, assisted suicide. I signed up with a group overseas, and I was very ready to go through with it. I was in such a dark space that it seemed like a really good idea. I had neck surgery in 2015. It went tragically wrong, and part of that was I was offered a lot more support. My quality of life just increased tenfold. I'm extremely grateful that it wasn't an option. I would have taken it, and I'd be dead. I certainly don't want it as an option for myself, and I certainly do not want this as an option for some extremely vulnerable New Zealanders. So Claire is a staunch no voter. She was considered a terminal patient before she had that emergency life-saving neck surgery. Now, the Disability Rights Commissioner was going to be a part of this program, but couldn't make it here today. She has been very public about her opposition, saying the Act does not protect disabled people and that she is worried that even with safeguards in place, they could be coerced into this, potentially even by their own loved ones. Now, Philip, you actually have a, a different perspective on this. Mm. Well, I don't believe that I would be coerced after anyone that knows me and then me doing the coerced thing not other people. And I believe there are plenty of safeguards in the act. In fact, at the moment, people can stop eating, they can stop drinking, they can stop taking medications, and there's no, um, there's no looking at whether that is their own choice or not. Sure. So this act is actually going to shut a spotlight onto the issue of coercion and make it more more safe for more, people. Make it make it make it more safe. I mean I'll bring you in here, Peter Thurkle. Do you do you agree that this could make it more safe for people or or do you think there could be coercion? Uh, you know, people sometimes are in vulnerable circumstances. Uh, and uh, as the Disability Rights Commissioner, Paula, would say if she was here, she would say it's really not a level playing field until we have a, other proper support options in place, for instance, for disabled I people. I wholeheartedly support yeah. that everyone should have access to the care that they need to live well in this life. But actually, there are people suffering at the end of life, and yours is nothing but a speculative theory because the evidence from overseas shows in all of the countries where this is legal, there is no over-representation of these vulnerable groups, so-called vulnerable groups, in the statistics. I think that's the wrong way to look at it, if I may say, because coercion is something that's subtle and hidden, and if it's successful, it's not detected. But like Philip said, this brings a higher level of scrutiny to this process. And of course, we must remember that the Act is explicit, that no person is eligible for the sake of disability, advanced age or mental illness alone. This is about people who are at the end of life and well, suffering greatly. Let me bring in uh, Dr Libby Smales here, because another group of vulnerable people is obviously our elderly. And one thing we do here is elderly people who think they're a burden. I mean... Is that something that this could protect against? Are there protection, uh, protections against that? Well, I'm with Jess, and I think it's really important to look at what the data tells us. 
from jurisdictions who have this sort of legislation in place. There is no evidence of abuse of people who are disabled or elderly. And I agree with Philip that I think a process, a legal process like this, um, can possibly make this safer. Sticking, sticking with that elderly issue and bringing you in here, Rod McLeod, you know, what happens around hospices? Is that feeling of being a burden, an elderly person feeling that they're a burden on their family, is that a real thing? Yes, it is a real thing. And, and it's a sad thing. I think as a society, we've lost sight of our ability to protect the most vulnerable and the elderly. It's not uncommon in a hospice to talk with family members who feel that the process is going on too long. And you go and talk to the patient and say, what do you think about this? And they say, well, no, I'm, I'm fine. I think there is, a, there is a disjunction between what the patient might want and what the family might want. I think the thing about coercion is that it, it, it's often extremely difficult to detect. The Royal College of GPs have said they're not in a position to detect coercion. But are you saying that doctors cannot detect coercion in yes, any I am. circumstances? Because yeah, then what do I we am. say our doctors can do in any life ending decision? I, are they I, not looking for coercion then? I could look for coercion, but I, I, I can't put my hand on my heart and say I've detected it. It's very difficult to detect. I just want to bring you in here because you've worked in suicide mm. prevention. I mean, what about the mental health side of things where someone gets a terminal diagnosis and becomes depressed, but albeit temporarily. Is that something that worries you? This, this, uh, it worries me um, uh, like you wouldn't believe. We have a hidden shame in this country around elder abuse. Yeah. Yeah, when yeah. you have a look at the UN report, one in six elder people are, um, uh, suffer abuse psychologically, emotionally, financially, you name it. It happens in the Te Māori world as well. And so when you have a look at all the different things that are going on, and we're now asking a question um, that will end somebody's life, uh, and then we start talking about the suicide um, impacts or uh, mental health. Look at our mental health and suicide prevention sectors. So what we have is a, a plethora of issues facing us today and we're not prepared to have a bold conversation about fixing all of these different problems mm. of investing wisely and doing more around prevention and all the other things. Mm. Instead, we've jumped straight to coercion, Patty. Up next, New Zealand has many different cultures and religions. How would euthanasia fit in? We're back in a moment.
Welcome back to this News Hub special. It's time to talk culture and religion now. On the Yes Couch, we have Canterbury University academic Te Hurunui Clark. We have Jessica Young back from the Yes campaign. And I should point out you interviewed a number of Kiwis for your PhD on this topic. We also have Peter Lynham, who is actually neutral on this, but is our religious expert here. We have over on the No Couch, Matthew Tukaki from the Māori Council, Ka Noa Lloyd from the project, and Afiso Collins, who is an Auckland councillor and a leader uh, in the Pacific community. Now we know from overseas experiences that the people who take up euthanasia tend to be white, they tend to be well educated and rich. So how would euthanasia affect Māori and Pacifica people? And does it clash with cultural traditions? Here is Mata's story. I love death. It's a process that we all should be comfortable with. When my husband died, he chose not to go to an undertaker. For me, that's one of the biggest events in my life. It's created the rituals close to what our ancestors would have done for their dying. I'm happy, you know, when people say euthanasia don't fit in tikanga deep down in my heart. I know where it can well fit. The ancient practices were that when people were dying, they were placed out on the maho, out of the doorway to the front of the house. You were taken off food over a period of time. If the person didn't die, then a little fari was made so that the tupapaku could die in there. A few the is one of those ways of saying, you know, I'm ready to die and can I die with dignity? Then, you know, I think in the tikanga Māori way, we could actually do that. All right, Marta is one of the leading experts on Māori death practices, but her view that euthanasia fits within te akanga is not universal. Matthew Tukaki, I'd like to come to you first. I mean, does euthanasia fit with Māori tradition? No, it doesn't. I mean, tikanga is different. You've got to understand the, the basis of tikanga. Every rohi, every district, every area has a different form of tikanga that might be applied. Yes, there might be some that do agree with, um, with the process of death and dying, but largely Māori, we don't embrace it that way. And in fact, what, what you could see is that palliative care and end-of-life care is very much a Māori thing, even before Bākehā invented it into a system. Um, we look after our own towards the end of death. We did that with my dad. Um, my grandmother um, did it at her home in Tauranga um, with people who would be returning to the island after they were sick, released from hospital. So there is a process that, that, that we go through. I mean, what's your personal experience? You've got a different, you've got a different view about where it fits. Yeah. OK, let's start here, Patty. Uh, Māori are not a homogenous group. So my perspective on, on uh, what, what is tika, what is correct, uh, differs quite uh, a lot to Matthew's. My, my uh, perspective is informed uh, by, once again, my mother. My mother who passed uh, 20 years ago. And one of the few times I actually listened to her was uh, in the last few days of her, of her life. And she was a staunch uh, Catholic and an advocate of tikanga Māori. And, and what did your mother tell you? What did she want you to do? Yeah, my mum uh, said to me, boy, if euthanasia was uh, a choice, I would take it. And so that threw me into a headspin because I was of the opinion up until that time that um, it wasn't um, compatible with tikanga Māori. And so for the last 20 years, I've been trying to sort this out. And um, what I've found in the research that I've conducted is that there are um, oral traditions that tell us that in certain circumstances, assisting someone to die is acceptable. Sure, sure. I want to bring you in here, Kano. And, you know, the point that outcomes, in fact, for Māori are actually terrible, and Pacifica as well. I know that that 
concerns you, doesn't it, in terms of this debate? Yeah, it does. I mean, not every New Zealander at the moment can actually get into hospice care, and that disproportionately affects brown people, rural people. I mean, Missy Vining's talking about postcode concerns, and, and I worry that this is going to be a rule, a, a law that benefits a certain section of society and uh, not everybody. Um, I'm, I'm like both of you guys, I, I, I'm, like, I'm not a tikanga expert at all, but I do firmly believe that if you, can, if you look to te ao Māori and you look to your whānau, they will have the answers for you. They might not be your answers or your answers or my answers, right. but there are answers sure. there. Yeah, Fiso, you know, what's the view out there among Pacific communities on this? Yeah, I think it's important to note, firstly, we're not a homogenous group either. And it's um, one of the things that we often talk about is that we are one as part of a whole. And so the challenge with this bill is it's often it's talked about as if it's your decision, it's my decision, it's my life. And that's a really hard thing to conceptualise for Pacifica people because we are part of the whole. And so there's a responsibility to each other to make this decision together. We often say in Pacific communities it takes a village to raise the child. The child is part of the village, is the village, the village is the child. And that that is why it's really difficult for us to come to terms with this bill because we, we have to almost stand out on the side. Choice is a fallacy in my view. The, the notion of choice is good for, as you said in your opening, in, opening lines, it, it works for those who are wealthy and comfortable, but we haven't had choice and so we haven't lived with much dignity and now we're being told, well, you can die with dignity. Jess Young, you spoke to these people as they were in their last days. I mean, where does culture and religion fit in with people at yeah. that point. Yeah, I was really fortunate. Uh, it was such a special time to um, spend with people as they approached the end of life and I talked to Māori people. Unfortunately, I didn't talk to anyone of a Pacific um, background. But I also talked to religious people and, you know, they felt that assisted dying was entirely consistent with their worldview and that this was something that they needed as the backstop for them if they were suffering. So, I mean, we can all make sense of assisted dying if we want to within our own worldview and if we don't want to, we don't have to have anything to do with it. OK, well, we're now talking about religion, which they say you shouldn't bring up at dinner parties, but 45% of Kiwis say they are religious, and there's no doubt that religious leaders have very, very strong views on euthanasia. It's not compassionate to end someone's life. The issue of euthanasia boils down to protecting the body and the soul, which is the inviolability of life or the sanctity of life. Human life is sacred. This change of law, we will see that the lives of some are deemed less worthy of being given dignity to the very last moment. Real compassion means accompanying, journeying with and walking with people who have a terminal illness and are coming towards the end of their life. OK, Peter Lynham, you've spent your life studying religion. Where does religion come into people when they come to vote on this? Where does it come in for people? Oh, I think it's pretty central. A lot of the debate actually affecting everybody is about your perspective of the value and the character of life. Remember that secular people in their own ways are religious as well, and a key part of their value is the right of the individual to choose. And I, that's a deeply held belief. But on the other hand, for many people of traditional religions, the sacredness of life means it's not something in your hands. And so those two have been the heart, I think, of the debate for religious people, that doesn't mean to say they reach the same conclusions. Sure. If okay. So I'll bring you in here, because part of the reason you're voting no is on religious grounds. I mean, people who want to vote yes say, well, hey, a priest or a pastor shouldn't tell us what to do. What do you say to that? Yeah, if you look at the last census, 70% of Pacific people noted a Christian religion, and then we had quite a religious group after that. I think what's important to understand is I, you know, there's been a lot of talk of people saying, oh, you're trying to force your morality on me. Choices of morality as well. The point I'm really 
uh, wanting to make that, that should be clear is that we see life as a journey. The end of life that we will care with you and hold your hand with you through is just a doorway into the next life. And so whether it's a Christian perspective or not a Christian perspective, it, it's, that's not the issue for Pacifica people. It's how do we journey through the whole of life? This isn't. This is just one part of the life. There's a next life after it. And that's where the Pacifica people are heading sure. from. Peter, Pe Pe Peter Lynham, I mean, not all religious leaders are opposed. We hear a lot from the oh. ones that are. I mean, are there ones that are actually for euthanasia? I can tell you that there's a lot of debate going on within religious communities on this matter. Uh, there's perhaps greater unity in the Muslim community against this than in others. But in most of the religious communities, for example, Hindus and Buddhists, uh, there's quite a diversity of views. Uh, the belief, for example, for Hindus that a good death will lead to a good outcome in the next life. So it's important not to mess up your death. Is, but then you can see read that in several different ways. Yeah. And I can tell you that in churches, uh, some leaders are going against what the senior leaders of churches have said and adopting pro-euthanasian views. Okay, great discussion. Now, we'll be back in a moment with the big question. Would this start us on the slippery slope to less restrictive euthanasia laws?
This is News Hub's The Euthanasia Question, and we have saved the big question for our last segment tonight. It is time to talk about one of the most controversial arguments in this debate, the slippery slope, as it's called, the fear that an initially tight regime may get looser and more relaxed over time. Back with me to discuss this is Sir John Key, Catherine Marks and Jessica Young on the yes side. We've got Missy Vining, who's undecided, and Richard McLeod and Peter Thurkle over on the no side. Now, Sir John, let's start with you. You know, you've been there, you've made laws. How hard would it be for this to be opened up? Uh, really, really difficult. So uh, when you look at these conscience issues, which is essentially how Parliament would have initially debated this, um, they are always highly emotive. And so people say all sorts of things. Go back and have a look at Hansard, uh, when homosexual law reform was being first debated in New Zealand. The argument, if it passed, was that there would be people fornicating in the streets everywhere. Well, <laughs> guess what? It didn't happen. And so the reality is, if you go and have a look, euthanasia legislation is in 18 jurisdictions around the world. Only one of them has actually she changed it and that's slightly widening it and that was Belgium with I think the age so really there's not a lot of evidence yeah. to support R R that. Richard you've got real concerns sorry, here that's just totally not true there has been euthanasia expansion in every country that has not enacted euthanasia laws. I mean, we've seen it in Canada, which is just four years in, who are already looking at expanding the law oh, after the Supreme Court has ordered it too. I know that. But they're also, they've expanded it in Belgium. They, they expanded it to children in Belgium. They've expanded it in, in um, the Netherlands, um, um, practically speaking, and also in, in, in uh, legislative ways through the Goningham Protocol, extending it to seriously disabled newborn babies. So I don't accept the view that it hasn't expanded. But yeah, let me... I do want to pick up on the Netherlands yeah. there because, you know, people as young as 12 can, you know, be euthanised there. That, that's an example of a slippery slope, okay, so isn't if it? we're talking about the slippery slope, what you have to understand, in countries like Netherlands, it started off that way, and this reflects a culture where euthanasia has been accepted for a very long time, even before they legislated it. Now, the Western Australia Joint Committee have done an extensive report recently and they found that the slippery slope argument was not made out at all. It's an argument that's used by opponents. It's been completely rejected. The permissive countries have stayed the same. Belgium is the only one that changed and that was a very deliberate decision through Parliament. Oregon is more typical and that is 23 years without any change whatsoever. Change. There's clearly been the slippery slope in the Netherlands and even people in the country themselves admit it. Bert Kaiser, who, who works at the Euthanasia Clinic, says yes, we have a slippery slope and he, he takes that as a sign of a progressive Society. Why has no place that has this law uh, in yes, place? In why have they not repealed this act if it is so terrible? Well, because they had the definition of unbearable suffering, and the review committees yes, have expanded right. the much wider law. The intention oh, much of wider their law. law. The intention of they those start. laws is about unbearable suffering. Sure. Our law is about people illness. who are at the end of life. It's, it's now gone to people with a range scenarios. of age conditions, and includes dementia and psychological illness. This they now have a bill before the, du the Dutch Parliament, which would basically introduce euthanasia if people are tired of life and they're over and age 75. And those bills have oh, failed in the past before. At the, at the moment, non-terminal illnesses aren't included in this. Things like Correct. dementia aren't included in this. Oh. Is that the sort of thing that we could see put Absolutely. into this one day? Look, the supporters of this law say no country's ever gone back who's, who, that it's enacted euthanasia laws. Well, there's only one reason for that. There is no going back. When you enact a euthanasia law, there is only one logical trajectory, expansion. Well, now the conversation will be, well, if we give it to terminally ill people who are in unbearable suffering, how can we deny it to non-terminally ill people who are in unbearable suffering? If we give it to people sure. in physical pain, how can we deny I'm, it to people I'm in physical pain? I'm going to bring you in, I'm yeah. going to actually bring you in here, Catherine yeah, Marks, yeah, yeah. about, about non terminal and 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 other issues like that surely it'd be fair to expand it to include those at some point could be the thing is that it's probably unlikely that it will if it does it's parliament because they think that is what their constituents want MPs aren't going to vote for something if they think that that's going against what people are but voting them what for. what about something like dementia or something like that one day expanding it that's not that's not available uh, in any of the jurisdictions that are similar to New Zealand, and you know, well, that's, that's a very difficult question. But can we just talk about the Belgium. slippery slope and the evidence they of the slippery slope? They're euthanising dementia patients uh, en masse. This is in, in the, the countries Belgium. where that's already been permitted really from the time. Law. Can we? Sorry, can we just talk about slippery slope? And that's about the expansion of the law. Those laws were already permissive. No, there but not isn't those practices. Any evidence not those of, practices. I 
The practices began in 2008 Sorry, and 2008. Richard, I'll let you have a go in a minute. Sorry, if you could just, just yeah, yeah, yeah. Look, the Joint Committee report, as unbiased people, experts in Western Australia, it's the same finding in Victoria, the same finding by judges, nine Supreme Judges. They have all concluded that the slippery slope argument that you're putting foot now is rubbish. And that's what I believe. And I'm and, sorry, you can... And, uh, English, and I would recommend and the, that anyone goes to look at these And the English things, House yeah. of Lords, which is now the Supreme Court, has found the exact opposite, that yeah. there is a slippery slope. But that once you true. make it legal in some <laughs> circumstances, there's no logical reason why it can't expand to but, others. But Parliament once, if this passes, won't want to come back there. But you know, you talk about things like, like dementia. My mother died of Alzheimer's. From diagnosis to death was five months. Her body weight completely hard and she didn't have a clue who I was at the end of it. Honestly, you know, if it wasn't to that personally, that that wouldn't worry me. If I was in that condition, I'd actually want that choice. So, you know, what would you have wanted to do for your own mother? Well, all I can tell you is at the end of it, she didn't know who I was. She actually forgot the ability to eat. That's why her body weight halved. Mm. I mean, it was an awful death for her. Mm. Would you have liked euthanasia to have been available for her, Sir John? I, I mean, I don't think I would have ever given the authority to do that because, you know, in the end, you know, I just don't feel I would have done that. But if I could, if I could do it for myself, I would, because... And then you're not sure that I want my family to actually look at me. And, like and that's an issue I'll bring you in on, Peter. At the moment, you can't write something into your will that you want yeah. to be euthanised. Mm -hmm. Is that a good thing that someone can't put it in the will that if they have dementia or Alzheimer's that they want to be euthanised? Well, I think it is, because in a way, to me, it's a manifestation of the slippery slope argument that we've been rehearsing. Miss yeah. Yvonne, I mean, you've been watching on here pretty, un pretty <laughs> undecided. <laughs> <you know? laughs> I mean, has the, have you seen anything tonight that started to, to change your mind? Yeah, probably um, a couple of things. Um, I liked hearing the stats that, you know, the majority of people um, used it at the, the very end because mm. that certainly would be mm. where I'd want the choice for myself and, and where I know Blair would have wanted that choice for himself and probably my girls would have wanted that for their, their dad. Um, I think it's um, really interesting hearing about what the other countries who have had it, where they, where they have gone, and I'd quite like to look at that a bit further. But, yeah, definitely... Probably moving to more more towards the yeses. Sorry, guys. Molly, I've got two more statistics for you. One is that we know that terminally ill New Zealanders are taking their life every week because they are desperate for this choice. They have no other choice, and so their option is suicide. This is reputable research over a number of years. And the second stat, the, I really have to this, Patty. the second statistic that I'd like to share with you is that 90% of yeah. people yeah. overseas are yeah. already and in accessing the palliative care. And, in, in the Netherlands. and those last 10%, they have a palliative care referral, just, but they've just, decided just, not we'll to. Peter in here. I, I wish the issue of suicide hadn't come up. It's a hot one. I would have preferred a truce on it. But you've brought it up, Jessica. There's absolutely no evidence for what you're suggesting, that this bill will reduce suicides for those who are terminally ill. And if you look at the Netherlands, studies over the last 12 years by Professor Theo Bohr show that during the exact period when they were expanding their criteria, oh, no the, way. the number of suicides went up by a third. All of those so the studies point are is, absolutely the weight of evidence, refuted right. in the literature. That's I refuse not to believe that. Absolutely right, this not. This is where we're going to have to leave it. We'll wrap up what is okay. obviously a very important and quite emotional and contentious conversation, that's for yeah. sure. We hope that this has helped you at home make up your mind. Now, a reminder, if something in this program has raised any issues for you, you can phone or text the Mental Health Helpline on 1737 at any time. Now, a massive thanks to our panellists tonight and thank you so much for joining us tonight. Now, I'm back here from 7pm on Saturday night with Tova O'Brien and Duncan Garner for News Hub's election night coverage here on 3. It is going to be huge and probably not quite as contentious. I'm Patrick Gower, <laughs> and this was the Euthanasia Question tonight. <laughs>